The Karanta Tiger by Hugh Allen Read and recorded by Apratim Viraj Singh It was three o'clock in the afternoon of a day towards the end of January. Squatting on the edge of our veranda was an old man who had just walked eight miles from his village to give me the first news of the Karanta Tiger. It was a curious story. A tiger had suddenly turned dangerous immediately after a strange noise had disturbed it over a kill at night. What had made the noise, nobody yet knew. But in a single second, it had turned a tiger that had never given trouble before into a terrible menace. This tiger has roared near the village every night since. He seems angry with us, and we are all very frightened, said the old man. The story had started after a party of woodcutters found a dead sampar hidden in thick jungle near the village. It was clearly a tiger's kill, for not only were there fang marks in the victim's neck, but on the sandy bed of a ravine nearby the pug marks of the killer were plain. After finding it, the party had moved on quickly. It was past six o'clock, and a likely time for the tiger to come back for a feed. The Sambhar lay about a hundred and fifty yards from the nearest of their scattered huts. That night, the moon rose early, so when the tiger was heard to leave the hills some way to the west and start towards the kill, several men left the village and crossed a field to a thorn hedge fifty yards nearer to the jungle. The direction the tiger was coming from would take him over open ground before he reached the trees and the men were hoping to see him. They waited by the hedge for nearly an hour, but when at the end of this time the tiger had not shown up, they started to drift back. The night had got chilly, and with nothing to see, the best place was bed. As they came away, all of them believed that the tiger had not yet arrived. They were wrong. By the time the last man left, the tiger had probably been on the kill for fifteen minutes and had started to feed. Then something happened. Just what, no one yet knew, but one of the men from the village told me later that before all hell broke loose, there was a sound, like a stick striking the trunk of a tree. This was followed a second later by a shattering roar. Then the tiger went mad. The same man, telling of the appalling row that now arose, described it as a furious forest devil beating the underbrush with a big tree. The uproar had lasted twenty minutes. Then the tiger had left the jungle and started to circle through the scrub about the village. He was still very angry, and to the frightened people huddled behind locked doors, he seemed to be searching for the thing he had obviously failed to find near the kill. The next morning, a visit to the remains of the Sambhar showed the men a wide area of devastation all around it. Bushes had been flattened, several saplings were found bitten through, and the bark on nearly a dozen trees had been stripped by furious claws and teeth. But what had caused the tiger's sudden rage was still a mystery. There was no sign of anything that explained it, and even with their lifelong experience of the jungles, none of the men could say what had caused that strange noise the night before. It was never heard again. But for the next few nights, the tiger came back and roared through the jungles around the village. Now, however, the men were hearing another sound as well whenever the brute passed particularly close to their huts. Some of them described it as a low moaning sound, while others declared it was more like a snarled sigh of anger. The real trouble started about a week after. The cattle had left the mangers soon after seven, and an hour later were grazing along the bank of a wooded nala half a mile away. The tiger came without warning, for none of the cattle winded him creeping along the nala bed. When he suddenly broke cover by a small bush on the bank, he was within a few yards of the nearest cow. It was a savage and vicious attack. The final toll was that first cow dead on the spot, and three other animals so badly mauled that two of them died before evening. 
When the last of the terrified herd had thundered out of sight, the tiger went back to the dead cow and dragged it to a small ravine a hundred yards away. There and then he devoured nearly half of it. But he never returned for another feed, and during the whole time his career lasted, he was never known to visit a kill twice. By the time the old man had finished his story, certain ideas had formed in my mind. Here was a very angry tiger, which had suddenly taken to killing cattle. He was a very suspicious tiger too, for he took his meals as soon as he had killed them and never returned for a second feed. Now, the most likely thing to have caused both the sudden change and the suspicion was a bullet. When I voiced this thought to the old man, he laughed. <laughs> this is not possible here, Huzur, he said. I will, of course, grant you that there are in our village several badmashes, or miscreants, men ready to do anything for a few annas, and who would dearly love to get a tiger skin to trade. But none of us owns a gun, and it is never possible to borrow one. And besides, if a shot had been fired that night, all of us would have heard it. Two days later, I saw this tiger's pug marks. I had gone over only for the morning, because just then work would keep me at home for another five days. The pugs, which I first picked up in the powdery dust of a footpath, were certainly impressive. If the rest of the tiger was in proportion to these, he must be one of the best specimens about. Just then, however, I was not concerned with his size. What intrigued me far more was the clue left by his pug marks, for it bore out the very thing I suspected. This tiger was walking with a great deal of his weight thrown on his right front paw. That surely meant some painful injury, probably around his left shoulder, and if my guess was right, it had been inflicted by a bullet. Once I was satisfied about that, I started for home. What I had just read in the dust did not really surprise me, and there was, after all, no mystery. In the old man's village, someone did own a gun, and it had probably been denied for the obvious reason, an unlicensed weapon. It would be an old muzzle loader, and when it had been fired at the tiger, it would have been double-shotted with two irregular lumps of lead. However, when charged with the crude country powder, these weapons have poor penetration, but they inflict nasty wounds, and if the tiger had collected those two shots in his shoulder, they would certainly account for his crippled condition. If the wound healed well, the tiger would keep going on cattle, but if it got worse, hunger would force him to seek some easier prey. To forestall that trouble if I could, it had been my intention to return in five days to start tying out live baits. However, on the morning of the fourth day, after I had found the pug marks, the worst possible news came in. The tiger, by now, had moved over to another village, some four miles nearer to the estate and from there, two days before, a man had disappeared. The man had been in charge of the village cattle, and had left with them in the morning. The first sign that anything was wrong came in the middle of the afternoon, when some of the animals straggled back. That was unusual, though nobody at the time thought much of it. Then, late in the evening, the village became alarmed. All the animals were home, but the cowherd was not. A search that evening and all the next day failed to find any trace of him. Not a scrap of clothing, not a shred of flesh, not a splinter of bone did anyone discover. The cowherd had vanished into thin air. That altered the whole situation. The jungle man is pretty much a fatalist whenever a tiger starts killing his cattle, and he seldom makes any real effort to stop it. What actually would be the use, he asks. Something has happened to displease the gods, and he must just grin and bear it until their anger has passed. Cowherds, however, are a very different matter, and when a tiger starts killing them, the jungle man sits up and takes some real notice. The bad news travelled fast. In no time at all, and over a wide area, parties of men armed with spears and axes were going out with the cattle. 
The herds now no longer grazed through the jungles, but were bunched together on open grasslands and kept well clear of any cover that might hide a tiger. Both men and cattle were now difficult to get at. Wise precautions? One might ask. On the evidence so far, they were wise under one condition only. And that condition was that this tiger went right away. For if he stayed, there was an alarming possibility. Nobody, of course, was yet sure about the fate of the missing cowherd. But if this tiger had killed him, then it knew what an easy prey man was. That, to a desperately hungry tiger, would start a train of thought. Why bother with the herds and the armed men guarding them? Why not turn instead to the outskirts of villages and lonely forest paths? Places where there were unsuspecting people, drawing water, tending to their fields, and bringing home supplies. Part 2 Five days passed without any kills, and I had begun to think that the tiger had moved away. Then, within the space of a few hours, more news about him came in. He had been seen three times, moving very slowly, and there were two reports of herds suddenly restless for no apparent reason. That news was both good and bad. Good, because no other attempt had been made to take a man, and the restless herds suggested that the tiger was still trying to get at them. But to find that he had not gone away was bad, for by all the rules he should have made off, because no tiger ever stays where there is nothing to eat. But could he go away? That was the question. My guess was no. His wound now was too painful to let him move far. The last time the tiger had been seen was at a spot some four miles from the estate. That was near enough to start tying out baits. For this tiger, however, there would be one unusual departure from normal practice. The baits would be tied during the day and not at night, because he never came back for a second feed. And once they were out, they would have to be watched carefully. For if one was taken, that would be the time to try for this tiger, in the only way that at present seemed to offer a chance, a stock up to a fresh kill. By eleven o'clock the next morning, eight baits had been rounded up and were waiting to be tied out at likely spots about our jungles. By mid-afternoon, they had all been sighted except one. Then, just as we were tying it, Two breathless men came racing across from Tendukera to say that less than twenty minutes before, the tiger had charged into their herd of cattle. It looked like the very opportunity I was now working for. Tendukera is a small village only about half a mile across the river, and if the tiger had killed, there was still plenty of time to catch him over the victim. However, it was nearly an hour before we were sure of what had happened. After the charge, there had been a great deal of confusion, and while some of the cattle had bolted home, others had scattered about the jungle. No one knew whether the tiger had killed or not, and the scene of the attack proved nothing. There was neither a dead animal, nor any sign that one had been dragged away. When the last cow had been rounded up and brought home, it was 5.15 in the evening. None of the herd was missing, but down the right back leg of a small bullock were four long gashes, still dripping with blood, which had been made by the claws of a tiger. As I looked at those four marks on a living animal, I knew that cattle were now more than this tiger could manage. He could maul, but not kill, and that was not going to satisfy his hunger. After seeing that bullock, I stood thinking for several minutes. There was no doubt now that this tiger's wound had got worse, and he was not only badly crippled, but also very hungry. It was likely, too, that he had been weakened still more by his recent attack on the herd. Would he have gone far after missing that bullock? It seemed to me that the answer was no, and what I thought more probable was that he was still somewhere close by very angry and almost certainly planning what to do next about his gnawing hunger. In that hunger lay the chance. It was the difference between a normal tiger and one which has started to prey on man. To get up to the first kind on foot, you need lots of luck 
and all the skill you have. To find the second kind, you need neither luck nor skill, because if you make enough noise, he will find you. There were nearly two hours of daylight left, and I decided to start from the scene of the attack. When I got there again, I had another look all around, but there still seemed to be nothing I had missed the first time. There was not even an indication to show in which direction the tiger had gone. However, one of the cowherds had been sure that he had made off to the south, although it was not wise to bank too much on that. Because all of them had been very excited, it was nevertheless a likely direction. That way and not far off lay the foothills of the Satpura Mountains, and plenty of snug places to lie up in. All the afternoon a light breeze had been blowing steadily from the west. That was something I could now use, for if it kept steady the danger of a sudden rush could be confined to one side the side away from the wind. In case that suggests that a tiger hunts by scent, let me add that he does nothing of the sort. He hunts entirely by sight and hearing. But as he learned at his mother's knee that nearly every animal he preys on has a keen sense of smell, he always stalks into the wind, even against man, for he just does not know that a man's nose is no better than his own. When I had left the scene of the attack some three hundred yards behind me, a small ravine barred my way. It was about twelve feet wide and six feet deep with a sandy bed. As I reached the bank, the first thing I saw was the tiger's tracks in the sand below me. On that loose surface, his pug marks were indistinct, but clear enough for me to make out that he was going mainly on three legs. The tracks led up the ravine to the left and keeping to the top of the bank, I started to follow them. After eighty yards, I came to a small pool which had a ring of mud all around it. From where I stood on the bank, I could see that the tiger had stopped to drink, and had left some clean-cut impressions behind him. Then I looked at the water in the pool. It was still and clear, and without a trace of muddy sediment clouding it. The water could not lie, and it told me that the tiger had been gone some time. I badly wanted a closer look at those pug marks, but before venturing down, I set off to make a wide circle round the pool. When I was back to where I started, I stood for another ten minutes listening. There was still no alarm of any kind, and so I went down to the ravine and stood beside the pool. In the firm mud, the pug marks were perfect. At four places, both the tiger's forepaws had been down together side by side. For a few moments, I stared down at them, not at all sure that my eyes were not playing me some trick. What on earth was this? As I bent down to examine them, I was still not believing what I saw. Monstrous! Now there was no getting away from it, for I was down on my knees and staring at the pug marks a foot away from my eyes. It was the impressions made by the left forepaw that riveted my attention, and I went over all of them with the minutest care. When at last I stood up, the whole picture of this tiger had changed, and my theory of a bullet wound in the shoulder had been shattered. As I stood by the pool, filling my pipe, I began to fit the pieces of the story into place. They fell together easily, and by the time my pipe was alight, I knew what had happened that first night, and I knew too what had caused that sound, like a stick striking the trunk of a tree. Just a thorn. And now it was in the pad of the tiger's left forepaw, which was swollen to three times the size of the right one. In the deep depressions left by this pad, I had seen the butt end of it in all the impressions, a small irregular dot in the mud. Just how the thorn got there I can picture clearly. I can see the tiger on that first night, moving above the dead samper and tearing at the flesh. On the ground nearby is a dead branch, fallen from one of the many jungle thorn trees. The thorns on this, perhaps two inches or more long, are brittle and ready to snap off. All at once that incautious paw finds one and the sudden cat spring flips the branch away to strike a tree. 
but the thorn stays in the pad. I had spent more than an hour by the pool, and when that story was at last put together, it was getting dark. It was too late now to go on, but as I turned back, I was not regretting the time spent examining the pug marks. They had solved the mystery, and unless I was very wrong, the threat to human life had now all but gone, too. Why? A swarm of flies had said so. All the time I had been examining the swollen pugs, the flies had been buzzing over them and crawling round the depression left by the injured pad. They were finding something more than mud, for Dr. Nature was hard at work, and I gave her but a few more hours before she burst the pad and let the thorn come away. As I walked slowly towards home, I was feeling happier. This new deduction that fitted all the facts so neatly into place was one that particularly pleased me. What was more, the main danger was past, for even if this tiger still hung about, he would surely stick to killing cattle, and there was not the same desperate urgency to shoot him. Sometimes even now, a shudder runs through me when I think of those thoughts and that muddle-headed complacency, for that deduction was hopelessly wrong. And as I walked home that evening, the Karanta tiger was just as dangerous as ever. The one real clue that would have solved the whole riddle was not to be found until a few days later. And then, when it was actually in my hands, I tossed it away carelessly because I failed to find any meaning in it whatsoever. Part 3 Early the next morning, I took some of the baits across the river and tied them about the jungles on the other side. If the tiger killed one, I should use the chance to get him out of the way, for he was still a menace to our cattle. But for the next three days, all the baits stayed alive, and there was no news of a kill from anywhere outside. So those signs in the mud had been right. The thorn in the tiger's pad had come away, and he was gone to resume his normal life. On the third evening, I brought the baits back from across the river. The next morning, my complacency was rudely shattered. The shouting, when I first heard it, was far away in the distance. The time then was just after dawn, and I was sipping an early cup of tea. It was too soon for any of our laborers to be on their way to work and skylarking as they came. But the shouting was coming rapidly nearer, and when it was almost up to the house, the sound of feet racing up the drive joined in. I put down my cup and went out to see what was going on. Outside the veranda, I found two excited men, breathless from running. They were cartmen, and when they were able to speak, they told me that the tiger was still with us. Where he had been, and what he had done for the past three days, no one will ever know. But from the cartman's story, it was pretty certain that he had not eaten. And now, driven to desperate measures, he had discovered the possibilities of the lonely forest track that leads from the main road out to the tiny village of Anjandana and beyond. Some of the story of that first bold attack came from the cartman, and the rest I pieced together later. For most of the previous day and night, the tiger had lain hidden behind some rocks close to the track. Starving and in great pain, there was no doubt of what he intended to do. This track is a lonely one, and carries only a few men on foot and an occasional bullock cart bound for market. Whether any men on foot passed by the tiger that day will never be known. Perhaps a kindly fate kept them away, for the tiger remained hidden behind the rocks until somewhere around midnight. By now he must have been at the end of his tether, and ready for anything. Somehow he had to eat soon or die. And then he heard them. At first, it was just a low rumble in the distance. Six carts, heavily laden with timber. They were still a mile down the track, with two hours to go to reach the main road. The only light on the convoy flickered from a smoke-dimmed lantern, swaying from the shafts between the leading bullocks. And the only driver awake was in the first cart. The other five were huddled under blankets, fast asleep. Suddenly, the leading cart jerks to a stop. 
a tiger is standing across the track. In the feeble rays of the lantern, his eyes reflect a dull fire. For a few seconds, nothing moves. Then the little world in the flickering circle of light explodes. With a bellowing roar, the tiger faints at the left bullock. Both the yoked animals rear madly back and then plunge away to the side of the track and the cart swaying wildly after them. Within a few yards, the cart smashes into and slams to a stop. The bullocks, snorting with strain like maniacs to break the thin rope harnessing them to the yoke. A moment later, one bullock wrenches itself free and goes crashing away into the black jungle, screaming with fear. The tiger has it a second after, but the kill is clumsy. The wretched bullock's dying groans haunt the night for nearly a minute. Not long after I had heard the driver's story, I was hurrying along the track, a part of which keeps to a low ridge of hills running across the north corner of the estate. After a short search, I found the remains of the bullock. Then I found the rocks where the tiger had hidden. Behind him he had left two clues, and it was one of these that immediately changed my mind for the second time about this tiger's injury. The second clue was the key to the whole mystery. The two things lay close together on a patch of well-trampled grass behind the rocks. The first was a ball of light-colored hair, still sticky and wet. The tiger had been licking at his injury, but as I was examining the ball of hair, a sudden thought struck me. How could hair come from the bottom of his pad? Obviously, it could not have come from there, which meant that there was another injury, either about his body or his legs. That put me back to the theory I had started with, a bullet wound in the shoulder. The thorn, which was certainly in his foot, or had been in his foot, was pure coincidence and had only made matters worse. The other thing was a small piece of wood, about four inches long. It was well chewed and bloody, and when I picked it up I went back to the dead bullock. The heads of these animals are often decorated with feathers, beads, and other kinds of ornaments. The slip of wood I was holding had once been round and about the size of a thick pencil. It seemed to me that it must have formed part of an ornament which had gotten mixed up with the tiger's meal. There was, however, nothing else like it about the bullock's head or neck. Perhaps whatever it had been had either been torn off during the flight from the cart or when the tiger was killing. Anyway, it was obviously of no importance and when I had had another look at it, I tossed it down beside the carcass. When I returned to the track, I set off to find signs of the direction in which the tiger had gone. The story I had heard about the previous night's attack was one that held out a great deal of hope. A hope, indeed, that was almost a promise, which said that to this track the tiger would return, and that somewhere along it he could be found and shot. Part 3 It is seven o'clock in the evening, two days later. Over to the west, the dying sun is just showing above the purple line of the hills. I am moving slowly through a darkening jungle towards the track, which is now about a mile ahead. Walking beside me is my favorite shikari, Bhutu, the same one who came with me to shoot the laughing leopard. In front of us lumber two hefty bulls, Ajax and Mars. These two are trained stalkers and are often used about the fields at night to get us up to marauding animals after our crops. Now they are harnessed to a double yoke and there is a lantern swinging underneath it. We should have started this game before, but I had believed that the tiger, because of his wounds, would not show up again until he was hungry. That assumption had been wrong. He took another bullock last night, one from a string of carts going home from market the drivers still unaware of the first attack, and thus completely unprepared for what was waiting for them down the track. Now, however, until this tiger is dead, no more carts will be using the track. The tiger's trick of panicking bullocks to force them from the yokes is known to all. So Bhutu and I are off to play carts, and we are hoping that the tiger will turn up 
and try to panic our bulls. But Ajax and Mars won't panic, for they are very different from the docile bullocks which draw the carts. These two are full of fight and will stand fast, for the smell of tiger in the dark is nothing new to them. They have been broken the hard way. Around the fields at home, we use them with an implement like an old wooden plow with the difference. The pointed shear stays clear of the ground until the handle is pressed down. If there is trouble about, the point is dropped and digs into the earth, an anchor that even Ajax and Mars find hard to break away from. Tonight, though, we do not have this implement with us. On the hard surface of the track, it just would not work. But this is something we have not told Ajax and Mars, because their toughest job yet might lie just ahead. But if only they knew it, all that is between them and Bhutu is a thin rope tied to their nose strings. The hands of my watch are pointing to 10.30. Ever since we reached the track, we have been moving slowly along it, while the light from the lantern swinging under the yoke has kept the long black shadows of our legs tramping beside us. We do not like either the darkness or the wind. Visibility is only the few yards to the limit of the flickering light. The wind dulls our hearing and is conjuring up a tiger behind every waving shadow. But there has been no real sign of the tiger yet. For since we started, the jungle on either side of the track has been peaceful and quiet. Even so, that does not mean he is not around. He may still be lying up or moving about with a great deal of caution. It is also possible that we have not yet attracted his attention. Midnight. We are now four miles farther down the track towards Anjandana. Just before we reach the crossing over a dry nala. I signal Bhutu to stop, and he reins in the bulls with a low clucking. We stand listening for ten minutes. There is still nothing that tells us of a tiger on the move. All we hear is the wind sighing through the trees and the howl of jackals in the distance. Is it worth going farther along the track? We decide no. A few hundred yards on will bring us into open country, which extends for more than three miles, and we do not think it likely that the tiger will be there. Bhutu prods the bulls round, and we start back. As we move off, the shadows of our legs fall into step beside us. As we plod on behind the swaying rumps of the bulls, I am conscious of a vague nagging in my mind. It has been there almost since we started, and I feel that something is wrong. For several minutes, I try to find out what is worrying me, as I stare down at the bull's hooves clopping softly into the fine dust on the track. All at once, I know what it is. I fall back some forty yards until I can just hear the clopping hooves. Of course, with my own rubbers and Putu's bare feet dead silent, we are not making enough noise and the tiger will be listening for carts. And if his wounds are giving him the hell I think likely, he will not be doing much moving about. He will be lying tight until he hears his victim coming. To do that, he does not need to be near the track. With ears as sharp as his, he may well be a considerable way off, far enough to be missing the flickering rays of our lantern as well. As this is going through my mind, I realize that we have forgotten something else. Ajax and Mars, when they are hunting at home, never carry bells. Now they ought to have them. To attract the tiger, we should be tinkling along the track like a cart bound for market. So I stop Bhutu and whisper what I am thinking. Then, before answering, he pokes the bulls on with the butt end of his axe. We have been moving for a couple of minutes before a laconic whisper says, Why didn't you think of that earlier? I don't answer him, but I do begin to wonder why he is driving the bulls faster. There is no point in asking. He is a phlegmatic type, and if he has any reason, he will tell me only when he is good and ready. Suddenly, the bulls stop dead, and I see Bhutu pointing over to the left. The abrupt stop catches me unawares, and my heart gives a double bound. 
Then my eyes are straining out of my head and leaping from one prancing shadow to another as the swinging lantern dances them about. But I can see nothing. There is no sign of a tiger. And for a fleeting second, my eyes flick back to Putu. He is still pointing, but in the dim light, I get the odd impression that he is a little bored and quite unconcerned. Where is he? I hiss. Over there. A dim shape just catching the outer rays of our lantern. A loaded bullock cart abandoned by the track. Idiot! I thought you had seen the tiger. No, Sahib. We want a cart and there it is. The cart is lying just off the track, its wooden axle torn from the mooring pins, the left wheel jammed against the body. It is the first cart wrecked by the tiger, and as we set about unloading it, Bhutu tells me the story that the driver only owned two bullocks and had been forced to leave the cart here after one was killed because nobody would lend him another to take it away. The repairs take only ten minutes. All we need are four wooden pegs which Bhutu quickly fashions with his axe. When these are in place and the axle straight, Ajax and Mars are put in the yoke and the cart is back on the track with Bhutu driving while I walk behind. Our progress now is noisy indeed. The empty cart is bouncing in and out of deep ruts with loud bangs and much rattling from its wooden rails. The iron tires are slapping into stones and grinding noisily through the occasional patches of gravel. We are tinkling too. A string of bells was found hanging on the shafts, the property of the tiger's first victim. It is now a few minutes after four in the morning. It seems much later, for the night has been a long one, and we are now very tired and covered with a fine film of dust. Not once have we seen or heard any sign of the tiger, and the excitement of the first few hours has passed. Monotony is starting to dull our senses, and for the past half an hour, my mind has begun to wander away from the job on hand. Idle thoughts are jumping in quick succession, from one thing to another. Odd problems about the farm, what really set this tiger off, and for what does the inscrutable Bhutu actually want the advance of pay he asked me for when we were mending the cart? Is it to buy that old muzzle-loading gun, as he says, or is it for an almighty bender on illicit hooch? I am wondering, too, about the number of nights we shall have to keep this game up. I decide that we are probably wasting our time, no matter how often we do it. The tigers you have to shoot are seldom easy ones, and it is surprising how often they seem to offer a certain chance by some unorthodox method. You always try the old way because you think it is going to work, but if you shoot the tiger at all, it is usually on some occasion when you least expect to. What we need now is a cup of tea to wake us up. After that, we can start for home. When I signal to Bhutu, he stops the bulls and then unslings the flask he has been carrying over his shoulder. We sit on the verge by the side of the track in silence and sip the strong tea. Ajax and Mars have found some grass along the edge and are cropping it. After refilling the cups, I find my cigarettes and offer one to Bhutu. He shakes his head and lights one of his pungent beedies or an Indian cigarette. We sit on for another fifteen minutes in silence. All at once, the night seems very dark. When I look about, I see that the bulls are forty yards down the track, and our lantern has gone with them. We had better move on. After screwing the cap on the flask, I hand it to Bhutu, and we start to our feet. The next few seconds are very confused. The tiger's roar seems to burst in our ears. <laughs> Hard on it comes a heavy thud and a bellow from Ajax. And a moment later, there is a loud splintering of wood and the lantern is smashed out. As I flick the safety catch off the rifle, an appalling din is shattering the night. The bulls seem to be flinging the cart all over the track and bellowing at the top of their lungs. I race forward a few yards and then snap on the torch. The beam shoots out and shows a blur of movement in the middle of a cloud of dust. The sudden light stops the flurry like a sharp word of command. Ajax is on the ground with the tiger on top of him. 
The next second, the light whips the tiger round, and he stands staring into the beam. I get a vivid impression of blazing eyes in a striped mask and a glaring white chest. The foresight is a brilliant dot in the light, and centered on the patch of white between the tiger's shoulders. A squeeze on the trigger, and a blinding flame explodes from the muzzle of the rifle. Without a sound, the tiger springs high in the air. For a moment, he is out of the narrow circle of light. A slight swing, and the beam finds him again as he slams to the ground and sprawls on the verge just off the track. Ajax, still bellowing, hurtles to his feet, and then with his horns down starts pawing angrily at the ground. Mars, with the wreckage of the yoke festooned about his neck, rushes up and stands beside him. But the tiger is dead. The shot has raked him from his chest to the root of his tail. Once we have made sure that there is actually no life left in him, we have a look at Ajax. Blood is streaming down his rear legs and over his rump, and across his back are long, raking claw marks. What seems to have saved his life was the yoke. When the tiger's fangs flashed for his neck, one of them dented the top beam while the other gashed into his flesh. When Ajax is as comfortable as we can make him, we turn back to the tiger. We look first for an old bullet wound, but although our search is thorough, we find no sign of one. The only hole in the skin is the one just made by the point three seven five in the chest. The Karanta in his foot must be the only wound after all, remarks Budu. Ever since I found that there was a thorn in the tiger's pad, everyone has been calling him the Karanta Tiger. Bhutu lifts the heavy paw while I shine the light on it. It is still swollen to a monstrous size and feels very hot. The whole leg is swollen too, and about six inches above the paw there is a patch of bare flesh with an angry red tear in it. I run a finger over the pad and it snags against something sharp. I tell Bhutu to open his knife and to be ready to take out no ordinary thorn. Ten minutes later Bhutu has it out and I see that the old man from the village was right after all. But he was wrong about his rogues, for even though none of them owns a gun, at least one of them did try for a tiger's skin. The wicked little thing in my hand is a crude arrowhead. In case I have left the clue of the chewed piece of wood too obscure, let me clear it up by saying that it was a part of the arrow shaft. On the night the tiger was wounded, the arrow had been shot almost straight downwards from a tree. It missed the tiger's body, but had sliced into his leg just above the paw, and the head had penetrated to his pad. The tiger would have bitten the shaft off within seconds of the arrow striking him, but he had not been able to worry out the first four inches left in his leg until the night he lay behind the rocks near the track. But what about the noise, like a stick, striking the trunk of a tree? About that, I am not so sure, but for what it is worth, my theory is that it was made by the bowstring. Many of the bows used in our jungles have double strings with a small strip of wood, two inches or so long, to keep them apart at the center and to which the arrow is notched. With the strings drawn right back for full power, with an extra long arrow, this strip of wood almost certainly would fly forward and strike the bow. That is the only answer I can think of that seems to fit. However, it should not be forgotten that the whole village might have been in the plot, and when it misfired, a hurried council might have decided that with a touch of mystery the crime might seem to lie on the shoulders of the forest devils, always well able to look after themselves. So choose which solution you like. The End